Why you mean Shrimp Marusa had enough juice in her computer? Yes. <laughs> wow. Well, also, you understand not having a dysfunctional computer is useful to her. So it's. <laughs> like, to, to me. Uh, yeah, like. Anyway. No, I wanted my mom to have a computer that functioned well. Yeah. And yes, if it functions well, it can run this software. So you see, that's a skyscraper built by one of the youth participants, 34 stories tall, with a working alarm system, elevator. So all that's built by hand, block by block. Did that pain break? Yeah, I'm just trying to fix the hole. Yeah, this is what I do. Yeah, this is the project that I'm working on. But what's the project? Uh, the idea, you can read about it yourself, but it's to create a virtual studio for youth in this game. And then if we do actually get kids making art in here, I have professional artists who can offer feedback and guidance. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, um, also some resources to create the prints that, that yeah. you just saw. So, I put it here. Um, uh, here. So youth participants, you know, once mm -hmm. we're communicating with them, mm -hmm. uh, we'll facilitate them in building a model like that, and then we'll output it for them. Exhibited at Grunt Gallery during an open house, and then after that, they get to have it. Wow. So it's, uh, yeah, that's pretty much the project in a nutshell. But information is available at gruntcraft.ca, which is the title of the project. Mm -hmm. So basically, what you saw me doing earlier was attempting to write um, a program, mm -hmm. basically uh, in three-dimensional space, that will help the participants orient themselves and understand what's going on, mm -hmm. what they can do, what they can expect. It is uh, incredibly challenging on two fronts. One is this itself is a complicated proposition and two, communicating it to others is also extremely challenging.
because there's a lot of biases and expectations and just kind of are those little torches yeah I'm just indicating that this program so this is what I mean by a physical program mm -hmm. see under construction I've put the torches to indicate that okay. come in gruntcraft object oriented programs mm -hmm. type of programming so what I'm doing is sorting all users into unicorns mm -hmm. registered or unregistered mm -hmm. users they should go to the website volunteers, staff members, mm -hmm. that's me, guests, and ultimately registered youth studio members. Mm. The idea is when you come into this world you're faced with these series of choices which sorts you into who you are mm -hmm. and then I'm going to be providing instructions on what you can do and how you can interact. Mm -hmm. And who put the cow in? The cow is my fault so for those who don't want to participate, I created an exit. Mm -hmm. But before I did that, or I yeah. didn't have a gate here. Mm -hmm. So because the doors open automatically, mm -hmm. basically the cow, so you're entering now the virtual art studio. Mm -hmm. And you had exited the program, so you're not mm -hmm. telling us if you're registered or whatever. Mm -hmm. So the cow must have gone up these stairs and stumbled into this door automatically opened it and wandered in. Oh, I see. So I've since installed the gate. Mm -hmm. Addressing the question of how to remove the cow, I might leave to an intern. Mm -hmm. you know, it's clearly not a terribly impressed mm -hmm. cow. Maybe we'll give it a patch of grass. So I think it's pretty interesting because it's mm -hmm. like you can see how kind of natural the space is. Like you can kind of think about it intuitively. Like you're already like you're watching it two seconds. You kind of have a sense of what's going on, right? Mm -hmm. Or you can imagine, or you can kind of narratively picture what's happened. Uh, which, with most games, I have to say, is not the case. So it's the accessibility of this particular game. Mm. That has allowed me to kind of propose what I'm doing. Let's see. Do cows eat grass? So these are all programmed little artificial intelligences. Mm -hmm. They have their little quirky behaviors. It's quite fascinating to observe. So when you say quirky behaviors, where do they get these quirky behaviors? They're programmed. Kind of iterative programs. But, you know, they have a certain quality. Oops. I probably did that again, was it? Yeah, you did. Mm -hmm. See, he's like stopped. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like. Like, look at that. Like, what? That's curious. This is like the cow jump over me, jumping over the moon. Yes. There is a moon. Um, but I think it takes about a week to get there. Mm. Like, I could keep flying at that. Mm -hmm. And if I held the button down for a week, mm -hmm. I might arrive at mm -hmm. a thing. The whole world itself has the square footage of the planet of Jupiter. And it goes down about, you can see, like a kilometer. Mm -hmm. So it's an absolutely vast virtual space. Mm -hmm. so completely. How can you program those dimensions? You just give it to them? You just say so many miles by so many miles? So how do you direct people to locations? No, how, how are they, how, how is the dimension programmed? Um, because there are dimensions, there are three dimensions in this yeah. game. One called the world itself, the nether, and the end of the world. Mm -hmm. Those are the dimensions that define the space. Mm -hmm. uh, it's programmed through algorithms, okay. uh, what are called seeds. So there's a little algorithm, it's like a fractal algorithm, right? So it generates, you've seen fractals? Oh, yeah. Okay. 
So we're harnessing okay. the power of iterative formulas to create similar but but iterative things like uh, you know create trees. You know, mm -hmm. so you spread the trees out semi-randomly, uh, but depending on where they land, you know, you'll get a birch or an oak. Mm -hmm. They'll grow over time. Uh, they'll grow from seed if the conditions are correct. Mm -hmm. and so it's like where trees are, where animals are, where grass is, where water is, is all determined via kind of a fractal formula. And then each element itself has a program that says, well, if I'm a tree and I'm in the right conditions, I will grow. If I'm not, I will die. If I'm an animal, I will try to find hay and I'll be afraid of fire. So it, the world then moves according to these patterns and programs. So did Grunt Gallery come up with all these programs, or are no. these snippets available? Because, yeah, that's heavy-duty programming. Well, this is, this is extremely heavy-duty, probably the most cutting-edge programming we have mm -hmm. available beyond, say, the financial markets. Um, so who did the programming? It's a company called Mojang, but there is one guy in particular uh, who's recognized as this being his kind of... Forte? You know, his, coming from his mind. Mm -hmm. uh, but he subsequently handed it over to a team. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the guy invented it mm -hmm. and created the kind of framework. But uh, since then, he's handed it over to others. So, mm -hmm. yeah, Marcus Person is the original guy. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I believe... One of the, I think, Jens has kind of taken lead from him, and mm -hmm. he's developing other projects right now. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it's uh, just, you know, it's. I think it's, uh, like, I've been fascinated with this world for years, mm -hmm. and I think it's, it's a really significant shift in our culture and media in general. Uh, but this game has made it so easy to, as you see, I can just start playing, I can be broadcasting to other people. Mm -hmm. you know, thousands of people could watch this, potentially. Mm -hmm. I don't have the audience, it's just me right now. Right. But, well, uh, you had me. Yeah, and I had you guys first. Was it up for, for two? Yep, that, that goes up to two when you guys were watching. Mm -hmm. You could have actually also have chatted with me mm -hmm. through that interface. Uh, yeah, like, ask I me questions, and the questions appear in the game. Okay. Yeah, I could get a microphone going, too, uh, at some point if I wanted to. You mean to. here? No, I could hear you. Are you sure you just didn't see me writing, or you heard no, me talk? No, I heard you. I heard you laughing or something or something. Uh-oh. I shouldn't do that, because that's embarrassing. Well, yeah. This is all being recorded. Yeah? Well, I didn't say that. Whatever. I haven't been swearing recently. No, no. Oh, shit. <laughs> See, normally I work alone on this, so I, I've never realized that I was recording my audio. Yeah. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> yeah, we'll put in a, an R rating on this recording. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But, okay, so now we can see how incredibly easy it is, well, yeah, right? Yeah. It can happen by accident. <laughs> <laughs> well, how can it happen by accident? Well, that's what happened to me. Well, I just, I should have noted that this microphone was on uh, active. It's my own silliness, to be honest. But, you know, we're all trying to do a million things at once, so... It's interesting, the time delay. But actually, sorry, explaining it to you is mm -hmm. precisely what I'm trying to do, mm -hmm. right, to, yeah. for the audience. Exactly. And so being able to take you through what I mean by this mm -hmm. object-oriented program, uh, 
And this way you've got already part of your manual there. Yeah, recorded. <laughs> People can watch that whenever yeah. they want. And I can go in there, take that chunk of footage, put it in YouTube, yeah. cut off the head and tail, and it's yeah. done. So incredible efficiency, right? Like what, I'm surprised. what used to be like, oh, can you write a manual? Da, mm -hmm. da, da, has turned into, well... Get get somebody who doesn't know how to do things and, and teach them. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And that's my kind of role in the project. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> so I'm learning from all, from these kids. It's, you know. Well, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Of course, yeah. yeah. Thanks for uh, checking it out. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Should I have any time? Like, not hold your breath. <laughs> mm, keep in mind, we got an audience. Oh, who else? I don't know. Okay. Just, uh, you know, there, there are people who... Yeah. Like, this is now a channel on that website, yeah. so people yeah. can drop in. Well, I'll... Um, like I said, should I have time? I don't hold your breath. I'll um, check out gruntcraft.ca yeah. and see if I can... If I can make better headway through it than trying to start up my Apple. <laughs> well, yeah. Which, if, which I seem to have fouled up majestically. No, no, it's, it's, the program is them. Is the program, them? Like, I think the dream is, is when we really sort out computing and programming, these glitches will be historical, like just a, a historical blip. Okay, so we'll see how historical or unhistorical Grunt Computing craft will, is. Computing will become absolutely seamless in the future. We, we yeah. won't recognize it for what it is. Good. Oh, when are you heading back? I'll be heading out tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to head out now because I still have to go visit Calco. Very good. And I'll yeah. say goodbye. And thanks for the... <laughs> oh, no, I'm really glad you were able to see it. Yeah. And, uh, nice to see you. Uh, I'll yeah. try to swing back to town soon and... We'll spend more time together. Yeah. Oh, I see your mug has been busy buying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, all the best with this. Thank you. Yeah. If then, you uh, need a real novice, just call me. <laughs> okay. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Who knows how to press all the wrong buttons? That's exactly. Yeah. I love that. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Are you interested in trying some limoncello gelato? Oh, thank you. No, I'll, I'll pass right now. See you later. Later.
The work as an installation, um, there's three different uh, bodies of work. Uh, there's the turtles, um, my wrapped grasses with hair, and then we also have the, uh, the cedar spears. The title of my exhibition is Omin Jimendan, which is an Ojibwe word uh, meaning he remembers it. The installation, when I started to conceptualize it, was I was wanting to address the idea of missing women, the reality of violence, and how to represent that within a sculptural form and within like an art installation. Within my work, uh, I had created these three different series, some carved uh, wooden spears, and then some wrapped grasses and then I had also created this little family of turtles. So when I was bringing them together as an installation I wanted to address the idea of memory and have the work be viewed and experienced as markers and signals as actual searchers for people who are absent. So originally when I started to think about how I would create the work I was thinking about the porcupine quill and how it is this natural sort of form of protection and it being like a really sophisticated natural deterrent, like a pr protective shield. So I wanted to translate that into uh, large scale sculptural forms. Once I started to make the work, I began to realize they, they were taking on like a spear-like quality. They also sort of resemble uh, teepee poles and I thought this sort of expands on the idea of protection and also the idea of shelter, a, a word that came to mind when I was unpacking my, my spear forms and like holding the work. Medicine. When I held them, I was like, these are a kind of medicine. And it also, there's like a kind of uh, healing, a history of healing that I felt within the work. And perhaps it's my own experience, my own, my own uh, process of carving the work. Was it like an actual action of healing within myself? I was actually thinking about uh, my mom and where she she lives right now um, in Ontario. And there's these really beautiful little islands everywhere, and they sort of just like emerge from the water, and they're just like really really beautiful. And the stone is like really smooth and black. They look like turtles, but they also come from an idea of the land and having like like almost like a, a rebirth for me, like when I was making these little this little uh, family of turtles. I guess lately I've been thinking a lot about memory and, and when I'm creating this installation and thinking about histories that are really difficult to address or to accept or acknowledge. There's a lot of things that are being hidden, a lot of like horrendous sort of things that have happened for First Nations women in the Lower Mainland. And I think that is something that I was wanting to portray through my work, but not sensationalized. I wanted the whole body of work to be really respectful, like a very calming sort of healing space. It's, it's a little bit of a conundrum in, in trying to create this work, but also be, be respectful towards people in their own histories. There's an action and a process of remembering history, and that is like that first action of remembering or addressing realities is the first step in the process of healing.
A baum is what I call a flicker film. I don't know if it's actually a, a, a real word. He's not, when you normally watch film, it's always a very consistent lighting situation. And um, so general idea in the in the industry when you when you watch film is that um, everything is quite consistent. You usually try to uh, eliminate any kind of flicker. When I shot it, I, I did it almost like I'm I'm writing a letter to somebody. I kept the shutter of the film camera open. I used it like a typewriter, the film camera, and basically wrote a letter. That's embedded in the film, and um, I, I forgot what I wrote at the time, but it's always there. At the same time, it um, creates like a visual, like a thunderstorm. So it's in a way, it's quite restless, the piece. The person in the image is, a, um, is somebody I know from the downtown east side. He's not a homeless person, but um, he used to be homeless, and he's, uh, that's all I want to say about this. Look at the, at the film projector, it's actually very similar to a sewing machine at the same time. And again, there is this whole element of a clock or um, things turning, universe, the cycles of life. They're all in, embedded in the techniques, and um, I like that in the piece. In this installation, I'd never use um, chairs. I like to have it. I like it to be like a walk in the woods. When you walk into the gallery, you walk into like a forest. Thinking about maybe incorporating like the parts of the music box into the piece because it's quite nice to have this really atmospheric little sounds. And again, it's a, it's a, in a way, it's a, again very much like the piece and mechanic or the box. It's something spinning really slowly. I did this piece a few years ago when I uh, didn't quite know my place. Um, felt a little bit lost. I was just walking through the woods. And I started thinking about, uh, I, I saw this, was walking and I saw this tree. It looked like, uh, looked like somebody running away and frozen in time. So I started to think about, about um, how we look at objects and trees and make um, sense of the forms. So the piece is shot on a 16mm film camera. And what I did, I used single frames Normally when you shoot a film camera, you push a button and the film will continuously run at 24 frames a second. What I did, I switched it over and I did um, everything in single frames. The piece consists of three 16mm um, film protectors and three loops. Because the three film loops have a different length, you can pretty much stand in front of the piece and look at it for many years and would never see the same just position of the piece because the, the loops run at different intervals. So it's ever changing, which I found to be also a really nice metaphor um, for the philosophical part of the piece. One of the plexiglass screens is animated by a uh, whistle motor and slowly turns. And um, it's a little bit like a clip. There's a, uh, I like to think about it, so, um, the universe, like the stars, how they go by. When I saw a bomb, I just looked at the room. It, um, and then I imagined in my head how, how the piece is going to set up and how it's going to look. It always turns out to be exactly uh, very, very different to what I just imagined. And that's kind of the nice part of the uh, installation like this, which has so many moving components. Because it really never is the same thing, and I, each time I'm almost re creating a new piece. So I will mean, put that there.
different elements of the narrative we're exploring. And in one way, the classic comic book is that hard edge, very sort of crisp, rectangular, uh, urban uh, planner's layout, um, uh, which has got the great white space in between, as if everything outside that story comes in. So, so that's why I use the form line, which is a, a high uh, uh, construct. Um, and I've, I've used that uh, undulating bigness and smallness and it's sort of stretching out and, and, and giving space form and dimension and, and allowing it not only to describe our little narrative, which is contained within it, but, but also to allow time and space to have its own narrative. It expands and it contracts and it has a relationship, sometimes dominant, sometimes lesser than. The relationship between the narrative that's contained and, and the form line that is the container, it changes. And neither one drives the other. They require each other to exist. Like we're saying, this, when we have created time and space uh, as, a, uh, you know, as, a, as, a, as a practical tool to, to help us navigate this experience, and, and sometimes it's big and, and drives the story a, a little bit, and sometimes we're big and we drive the story a little bit. But the two need to uh, commingle. They need to, to have this uh, dance, this uh, push-pull relationship. I very, very seldom have a uh, script that I'm working with. There are examples where I do, such as Red, Hide and Manga. It, it's 108 pages and it's a very complex piece, and I had to. Uh, to, to work with the script because it's based on an on oral narrative. But for a, a standalone piece, a, a much smaller piece, I'll just start doing the work. I'll just start, I'll get that brush slopping across the paper and just see what comes out of it. And it, and it seems that what's really uh, enjoyable is when I find that, that initial moment when I can uh, get all the clutter and chatter out of my mind, and it's, it, there's a little visual image that goes with that, and that, that is of a large brush, imagine it, you know, circumference in the barrel of something like this. And well, the bristles at the end, but it's empty. And, 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 and when I can sort of find myself as an empty brush, and no, nothing in, in there, it allows the ink to come in. It allows something to come in and flow out the end of the bristles, and then, and then, and then, then my mind starts kicking and saying, "Well, that's kind of weird. Turn this, this way, way upside down, backwards, and whatever." And things start coming out, and then the narrative does start to come out. And it's interesting that what I'm doing is, once the narrative starts, uh, that period, the conscious narrative on on the page, I will often do something to completely remove it, turn it turn it around. It's called a rotation. I call it a rotational series. And, and so I'm always tricking myself. Ah, you know, oh, you're getting yourself in there. Let's do that. And what I'm hoping happens at the other end is that the observer sees the work, let's say it's a piece of work hanging on a wall, and there is little to indicate where the proper horizon is. There is a, a minimal reference to the authority of the artist, to any authority for that matter, I guess is what I'm really trying to get to. I want to get to a place, I get to a place where people decide I think I like that, like this, or like that. And welcoming people, individuals, to take control of themselves, to question it, and, and not to be looking at a painting and say, ah, the painter has signed his name at the lower right-hand corner, therefore, this is up, this is down. And I I, I signed all the corners, actually, I initial here, and you know, I flip it now, I put my little I'm having number on it now, I'll put a title there, and then I might put another little thing there. And it's really to have people understand that when you switch the, the laws of gravity around, it is not the loss of everything. It is the discovery of something in its own way. There is no diminishment of us as humans. It just gives us a whole other wonderful way to discover the world. Chief Skinny Git, uh, Ron S. Powell Skinny Git, and his son uh, and a couple other friends who would go and take these Japanese students out and leave them in the forest for hours on end. So they had these very sort of personal experiences. Uh, and it was during these conversations that would take place on these trips, which would last a week or so, 
that I heard about manga cop as was a comic book artist, which was a, a, a respect, respected profession, and that wasn't the case here at that time. My work in terms of the, uh, the look of manga is not manga. It, it, it's truer to what I understand the definition of manga, which is art without borders. Right, and manga is less an effort. There is no effort to try to replicate a Japanese technique, but it is a an appreciation. The marriage of Haida and manga uh, helped me position, locate it uh, for myself. Being blatantly self-serving in the first instance uh, has created these um, uh, uh, circumstances that have been encouraged by, by, by audiences, by gallery goers, by collectors of art. And there seems to be something about get the chatter out of the way and do, do this little thing that I'm doing here. And uh, if it's true and it feels true for me, it, it's going to work. The starting point for a relationship to that which is around us is not so hard-edged, it is not such an imposition, and it really is more of an integration and, and a flexibility. In sort of translating that into art, well, that's, uh, that's something that I feel that I've always got to see it, scribbled and played around with. Fortunately for me, when I became older, unlike uh, most children, I didn't lose that, that uh, creative expression. I didn't channel it off or deny it. I just kept playing with it. And I think that comes from uh, from, from within a community that, that really does value the creation of, 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 of objects. So the people woke up and saw, there's a whole audience and a whole set of, of questions, important questions and, and themes that are not being addressed in comic books. And so let's let's open it up. Let's talk graphic literature. Uh, let's... let's, let's uh, Let's really look at it and, and see it as a very complex uh, uh, art, art, art form. And we need to be honest about who we are in terms of relationship to that which is around us.
Uh, when I was working with portraits, I was working with the idea of, of recreating uh, physical representations of memory. And, and that, that really didn't work out with, with, with this type of medium. But I, I, I did notice that it took me, took me quite a bit of time to put together the image, and they were larger than life size images. And I was trying to, at that time, I was, I was working in sort of a future shop. But the job that I had before, I was working at this this eBay store office space where um, I worked for some German bosses, and my job would be to kind of file in reports and photograph images of eBay items. And that was my 9 to 5 job. I was interested in the photographic images of the actual office spaces because I spent quite a bit of time in those spaces. I was uh, doing web work and doing graphic design and filming these DJs in town. Uh, one time I would work the morning shifts and then after I would pick up some shifts at future in time. <laughs> So trying to do all all these things, just at, at the end of the day, I was just frustrated. It changes our perspective with, with time and, and space, at least, where um, where we don't appreciate it as much as as, as we should. Yeah, different people need different things. Some people need the comfort of a, of of that type of routine, and, and then after some people are. Comfort of taking risks. <laughs> I've always thought, what if I dedicated the amount of time I'd spend with uh, a working job, in, and and take that time and flip it over into my art practice and see what I could come up. I think the earlier installations, it was very frustrating for for me to figure out. Um, the time frame and what's actually going with the performative aspects of the project, and um, and I just I didn't have like I, I didn't have the time to figure it out and sit down with the work and actually review what was going on, and after after taking for for two years from the, from this body of work, I'm. I'm I'm actually starting to, to see newer elements that come from uh, like parallel the, the life of the nine to five or going with this nine to five routine and working in the space and uh, and now I'm working with a couple of webcams to kind of document the process and share it with people online and uh, it's really neat. <laughs> This started uh, when I started the university. I even started before because I was working for the University of Archaeology when I was still in high school. At that time, reading stuff, uh, you know, scientific stuff on uh, archaeology. You know, it all began with finding arrowheads as a kid. And then it just happened. I had the chance of meeting a, a really good archaeologist who was teaching. Just pick me up, took me up there and put me to work in what I kind of did and just sort of include me. The skulls are really how we understand our evolution. That's probably, I mean, you know, one of the main things. And that's, that's more interesting than the hips. <laughs> in both ways, you know. <laughs> Maybe depends on your too, but uh, they, they, because. Uh, <clears throat> The hips would tell you whether you're standing upright or not. You can tell that, you know, from the hips because of where the bone is located on the leg. If you're leaning forward, then the, the, the joint is different. Same with the head. The way the head sits on top of the spine indicates that they are upright walkers or not the walkers or bend over a lot. And uh, skulls are just, they are uh, sort of like 
first line of of, uh, of exploration for for paleoanthropology uh, anyway, and anatomists to try to understand what has happened to us. They tell you what they've been eating. They can say they had had good years and bad years. Uh, well, was there droughts? Were there starving sometime? And then they just even you know, take some of these figures and they can say, well, between ages six and eight. Almost, uh, almost starved in this, but still working out. Here you can kind of see how, how the face is kind of stretched way out there. And this is not a, that old. I think this is a. Uh, it's not that old. Yeah. So this is, this is where we have set up as our first tool maker. Top of the head grew, crown. So the crown grew as the face shrunk. So anyway, as it's called, it becomes a way of reading, of reading uh, our, our evolution, our physical evolution. Eight steps in our cognitive development as a human species. Step one, get up, eat. Step two, sleep, hunt, eat. Step three, sleep, hunt, take steps, eat. Step four, sleep, take steps, hunt, eat. Step five, sleep, take steps, hunt, prepare, eat. Step six, sleep, take steps, anticipate, hunt, make ready, eat. Step seven, sleep, take steps, anticipate, set to work, hunt, cook, eat. Step eight, sleep, take steps, anticipate, set to work, hunt, clean up, go out, eat. Say something. Oh. Not up a respect. Oh. Who the fuck is that? 
because they got too close to the black hole, which looks a bit foreboding. I 
I mean, it, I think that each one takes probably about a month of my life. Maybe with a composition where I'm not too sure what I'm going to put in there as a subject matter. So those things can take a little while as well. You're really faced with so many decisions. And when you look at a painting, you don't think, wow, that took like 10 million decisions, but really, like, it does take that many decisions. It's just when you're confidently working, you're making them really quickly. So it's it feels more natural. And I think it's just the practice of making those decisions that helps you to get better as an artist and, and move forward with your work. So, which when I was choosing the title, I was thinking with the monster works. You know, there are some works. You know, we have you know, human, <coughs> human being you know, as, a, as a subject or object that we of the work, and in some of them we, we have everything except human being. All it's all about the lack and law of you know the the human. First of all, the meaning of the works are you know mostly photography and short movie, uh, and I, I don't call it video, but. Uh, in photo sequence format, huge frames, within each frame we have a couple of shots and mostly black and white. And yeah, there are all of the, the situation after the presidential election in the wide in Tehran. But I'm not showing anything directly. It's all about that, but without seeing anything about that directly. So it's totally about it, the kind of you know the body of absences. It's kind of really sparked by the huge violence as you know emerged at the state, you know, at the time, but I just tried to, to deal with that violence without showing that violence. So it's in a way super personal, but I just re relied on my you know, sense of intuition you know, as the as a kind of you know, representative, you know, a representation of that of of the body of the society. But it's all about the absence of the culture and the culture which is being replaced by the new forms of it, which is not mine. I'm not talking about the kind of you know, cultural invasion or something like that, but reification of the culture, which is, I mean, something's going on inside in my country which doesn't have any context. And it looks kind of exotic, it looks uh, good looking, but in an exotic way. It doesn't fit, it doesn't suit my people. But uh, I'm not just you know, yelling about this, that, you know, why is that? I'm just posing some sort of question that what's going on, you know, why it's happening. In this series of work, uh, um, I was at the, uh, at the time of producing them. I was suffering from the from the abandoning of my culture, the stirring of my culture, which is happening in an instant in the country. Yeah. The, the title of this work is a representation of representation, representation of the self portrait number two. This is my self portrait. One sentence is getting repeated over and over, and in a way constituting my self portrait, which says. It only means that you may not be able to argue with the admirer of the violence. So I say, okay, that's fine. If you want to represent me like this, I don't have any problem with that. But be careful if somebody's in cutting this screen of representation and doing this, you'll see that the frame is empty. So this is only the system that they're representing, we're representing me as, as a body of violence. In a way, I stole it. Not in a way, I, literally, I stole it. I thought that maybe it's a painting, you know, just who was left there you know, from you know, the former students. I brought it into my studio, I opened it, and I said, oh, that's a fantastic you know, empty <coughs> frame. I'm gonna bring one of my photographs and install it in, but I didn't do that, so I used it as kind of, you know, typical, typical notion of the frame, the centralization, the concept of centralization, defining, labeling people, you know, within the frame. Yeah, I mean, it's a stolen material, I have to admit that. Quote from Karl Popper, who's the kind of you know, leader of the liberal theory and you know, liberal, neoliberal you know, philosophy, and have a huge rejection toward Marxism, and I have a lot of you know dislike for this for this guy. 
That's why I chose you know this kind of quote from him. The what is amazing for me is the is the word it. That it only means that as if the whole thing is an object. When when someone is being defined as violent as a noun, is an it. It's an object. So it's not a subject. We don't want to know. It. We don't want to deal with it anymore. Just let it be there. So that's why I chose it from him. I mean, if, I, if I'm going to summarize the whole show in one word, or one expression, it would be about the culture of reification, uh, not objectification or reification, because this show is all about my culture which is getting shattered and shattered and shattered. Emerging artists from the far north. Why Kofi So, uh, hello everybody. My name is Tanya Willard, and I'm a curator for an upcoming exhibition here at Front Gallery. We're a Canadian artist-run centre based here in Vancouver's East Side. We produce exhibitions, performances, and projects, and continue to work as well as websites. Yeah, there. Our next project is Blizzard, which looks at emerging artists from the far north. The exhibition will open July 6, 2012. It's inspired by the impact of a lot of the works in the exhibition. It includes five different artists, uh, Jameson Pitsilak, Tanya Lucan Linkletter, Matt Eskimo, or Geronimo Inutic, as well as Nicholas Galanin. And <laughs> Northern Haze in the Media Gallery, which will feature a uh, documentary work about a rock band uh, who sang in Inuktitut. Now, all these works are really about framing an understanding of the North that takes it away, hopefully, from a paternalistic kind of relationship uh, in order to view it in a kind of continuum of contemporary practice, contemporary Indigenous practice. I've recently curated an exhibition called Beat Nation at Vancouver Art Gallery, and that same idea of, uh, of how the vision of those artists has come through in looking at hip-hop and influences in Indigenous aesthetics and Indigenous art is uh, a similar kind of way that I hope to frame some of the artists who are going to be featured in Blizzard. And I'm really positioning us, myself, as a curator, as an outsider, to understand this work. In order for Blizzard to be successful, we're asking for your help. We do have some support for the exhibition, and it promises to be a very exciting one. We really want to produce a catalog that will support the artist's work and be able to continue interest in their work, as well as in Brunt Gallery's programming. And we're looking for $2,500 and looking to ask you for your support. So we're asking for contributions. In exchange, you're going to get a really great first edition of the catalog. Um, as well as other perks from products and publications. We're looking for that little bit extra uh, in order to cover the full cost of the catalog. That catalog will be yours if you choose to support this project, as well as you're invited to all of the openings, and you'll be able to get all kinds of other uh, perks and treats from Grant Gallery's uh, publications. They've done a lot of really interesting projects with artists, and so we're going to put together a great package for you who choose to support this project. I've been so honored to work with them and uh, to really be able to bring some amazing projects to fruition. So thank you, Cookstown. <laughs> Check out our site at grunt.ca. The name of the project is Key Kite 1982, and the project is a, an offering to uh, New Westminster or the Key Kite Nation because I was born there and I um, feel it's difficult to describe because um, incredible atrocities happen there. And if those atrocities had not happened, the city would not be there in some way I wouldn't have been born. So this is my way of giving back a little bit, showing my gratitude. It's hard to talk about, but uh, I tried to manifest how I felt in this exhibition. I didn't plan it out this way, but it just turned out that it seems like this wall 
here to my right represents the past in some way, or a balanced reality where uh, humans and nature are are living in in balance with each other, in respect and recognition. Right. Structure is a simple construction of very simple materials like dimensional lumber and um, there's three equally spaced spaces inside and on the two ends there's uh, walls of cedar. There's a, a circular drawing of the flow of the Stalo River and there's also those two points where Grunt Gallery is here and that's the Royal Columbian Hospital. And there's other places like uh, this little island I was very interested in, which is Poplar Island. Uh, that's where Grunt Gallery is located. And that's uh, New West down here. There's these uh, circles of humans floating about here. And uh, it felt like they represented like a whole human being that was coming back into a state of balance with the world again. That's what I feel like this, all these drawings on this wall, what they feel like to me. And uh, there's some patterns on the wall here that I thought were really inspiring. I love patterns in nature. So the ones at the bottom were um, the salmon skin scales. So there's uh, this incredible pattern overlapping. And then above that, there's uh, traditional cedar weaving. I wrote these, these three little poems, or just words, whatever came to me, relating to the past, present, and future. And uh, the performance was entailed I was re speaking these words out loud as I was also doing playing some percussion instruments or playing the building itself. It talks about actions being driven by fear and greed. And others uh, genocide almost on the natural world and people who revere the natural world as, as uh, intricate to being alive. It's like everything in this, in this realm, it seems right here, is like falling apart or has fallen apart. Things are very broken and fragmented. And there's no real representations of nature on this wall, this map of it's a section of a map, but it, it's all tr streets that have been traced from the map. So it shows how how we've cut up nature. We've cut cut it up into these very angular shapes in order to accommodate vehicles. And there's no no trees or no notion of nature in the like almost all the rivers in the city are, are underground and flowing through a culvert. And <laughs> engineers will want to control all of that and control the flow of river because maybe it's seen that water is problematic to urban development. It's like, I can't imagine something more, I don't know, backwards. My name is Emilio Portel. Key Kite 1982. This is a, an ongoing installation honoring complexities and mysteries of Key Kite history, Canadian colonialism, and my own personal journey with, uh, with that history. I was born in New Westminster in 1982, which is a traditional Kikite Nation territory. Thank you. Hope you enjoy the show. Good 
other side is um, there's like a street urchin it's a usually a kid who's scruffy and poor and lives on the streets this particular pipe i think it's the same scale too um used to run under the ground up to my elementary school when I was a kid and I, that's how i used to go to school was, uh, i used to and i used to hide in it too as a kid it was my special special little so that's yeah that's where that came from um so you're the gutter snipe? Also, my desire, yeah, my desire to be a gutter snipe because I, I grew up in a very, a I grew up in this very sort of crude, you know, Victoria culture, and I, I wanted to be that foul-mouthed, slobby, uh, street-smart kid. Is a pipe, and then they, then no, they it was, sort it's of like it a, it's a flat sheet that they wind up, which I didn't notice so much until I cut it in half, and it went. That's why it's ah, so hard to put back up. It's got tension in it. It's got a spring in it. Yeah. yeah, it is like a slinky. It's so. It is like a giant slinky. It does remind me of that Carl Andre. You know the one I mean? It's these big L-shaped slabs of steel. Yeah, yeah. And the shadow, the lights this way, and sure. so it casts these big shadows. Yeah, nice. It's like Andre doing Sarah sort of thing. The boxes, and then I own that box. I own a few of those. They're they're uh, they're thin. Yeah. But they don't, well, they don't get all Well, this one is, I almost cut it all out. I wanted it as thin as possible, so it's... But that's what I've always wondered. Like, when you're cutting, how do you know when to stop? Cut. Because yeah, they could collapse. What, what they do is they is they give musculature. Look at this one. Yeah, right? it gives it uh, strength. Uh, yeah. Where is it? With some I boy could, or something. This one here. This like, look at his arm. So yeah. you did that deliberately, right? Well, yes. Partly, yeah. Like it it gives them shoulder blades. And look at it, look yeah, it moves exactly. in its head, and I mean, it does things. That's also a structural thing. Like this. Ah. Yeah, yeah it's got to be really it's I can cut out a lot it. more, and it's still fine. I have to say, this piece is, it's funny that this is my first it's show in British Columbia, where I'm from. And uh, this is probably the one and only pseudo-personal piece I've ever done. The other pieces, I'm mostly interested in uh, changing an, an object into a new object. But this one seems a little more, um, a little more dealing with the surface and narrative. Um, and this is probably the first time I was uh, more, uh, just letting things flow, not being so concerned about what every what every decision I make, what it meant in relation to the object. You know, this is the first time I think maybe it's just getting older. But I just, um, I just leave it and let it happen as far as imagery goes. Um, whereas before, you know, it, it was always so specifically about the relationship with the object and the image and how I change the object into a new object in that relationship between those. This, I think, is a little more free, a little more open. If, if it's true that this fretwork screen imprisons and then it kind of allows that rock to kind of roll up like a book, I think kind of feel that way. No? <laughs> you feel kind of safe? Like as a bug? It's like that space under the waterfall. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. 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 And just know that we all hold a whole lot of images in our minds somewhere. And they're, and, they're, and they're running like a film in our heads all the time. And it's not just when you're asleep. It's just you can't see it during the daytime. It's like the sun's out there. You can't see the stars. It's, it's all there. It's just shh. And this reminds me of kind of all the... It's like film. It's like a, it's like pre, pre-cinematic film or something. Or pre, pre-film film. Sculpture film. Mamuk, Mamuk, Ipsuit, Ipsuit, Mamuk, Ipsuit, Mamuk, Ipsuit, Ipsuit, Mamuk, Ipsuit. My name is Desiree Palmer. I'm a Dutch artist working in Vancouver, British Columbia, with the Grand Gallery to create a youth project 
called Namuk Ipsut. The project involves seven Aboriginal youth and explores their relationship to the Vancouver urban environment. The title Namuk Ipsut is a Shina phrase that means to hide or make hidden. Each youth is asked to choose a place in Vancouver city that is meaningful to them. The project itself involves all of us working together to camouflage paint the suits into their chosen landscapes. Often this project takes place in uh, areas where the children's connections to the land is extremely important. Mm. So it's, it's about their relationship to the, to the city and their place in this city, in the city of Vancouver. First, after introducing my work, I, I showed them what I did and how I came to the work, which is um, camouflage painting suits in urban mm. environment. In my case, it came from the monitoring of street surveillance cameras, but it could also be uh, like blending in to your favorite spot, which was really interesting because all the kids took later came out took their favorite spots in the city well first we we i, I provided for all the kids these white suits and we went like with a blank page which is in this case a, a white suit we went to the different locations and we made a picture of their favorite spots standing in the white suits Then we returned to the gallery where we had this working space next to the gallery and we started to make the, the drawings on the suit for blending in into the location. And it should be from the perspective of the camera. So we took the pictures and the kids worked with these pictures, drawing and painting on the suits. That took us kind of like two, three days. So it's quite kind of difficult to blend it, of course. And also like you, having the right color, having the right lines to, to kind of disappear on the spot. And then, and the location I picked was Scotia Bank Theater downtown Vancouver because I watch a lot of movies. Right? I'll call my project Camouflaging at the Cinema. It was like this uh, reflecting the windows in the door in the entrance of, 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 of the cinema. And But it worked really well. The picture is really fantastic. It's completely kind of half the spot. My name is Alicia and my picture I picked was the BC place. Because I like to like look around me where the water is. Letizia's photo was really brilliant because of the colors, you know, like the, the white and the, and the blue and also this really nice view. I felt really this is going to be hard, but she really got, got kind of like feeling for the colors, like the blue and, and, and we were also a bit happy because the weather was steady, like all the time sound, so it's kind of, it really worked out well and it's, it has this really kind of optimistic summer feeling in, in the picture. Oh, that's going to be cool. With the blue? Yeah. This is really nice. I love it. We only had white, black, yellow, blue and red paint, so you have to be able, I learned that in school, to make all the colors you can imagine. So it's, uh, kids did learn that and also kind of 
where is this line going? It's on your shoulder, on the back. Is it lower than your arm? You know, like they kind of really had to look careful where all the perspective lines of the building, for instance, start or end. So it was kind of a hard job they had to do. I'm Daniel, and at the location I picked four was a pond. I named my painting the tree. Starting with Daniel, it was great because uh, I, uh, it was like he sitting in front of this tree, which his hair, the color of his hair is really exactly like the color of the tree from, and I really like his photo, like also, he's just like kind of in the same vertical strictness as the tree, so it fits really well, the two of them. <laughs> Well, I don't think they thought it was easy, but probably it's, it was more difficult than they thought. <laughs> I don't know. It's really hard, and, and, and I know, I also experienced that it's really hard. I also made suits which didn't work at all, so you just have to see your failure. <laughs> I picked a nature, natural pond in the middle of a park, in the middle of downtown Vancouver. Very natural and just not at all like everything around it. I go there a lot. I feel connected to there. It, it's very different than the rest of the area I'm used to, so it's a nice change. In Carson's case, it was really funny because it was really uh, quiet, as she was also thinking about like her favorite place is quiet and then for the final picture with Henry it was crowded the whole pond was full of kids and there was this mom going into the pond it was really nice weather and all the kids were plunging in the pond <laughs> uh, I'm Danae and the location I picked was uh, the phone booth uh, it's Go to the school there, so it's pretty much when school's on, it's almost every day I walk by it. When we went back to the telephone booth drive, they put a door in. Can you imagine? When you had the door in it, it's a completely different picture. But then we decided to put the door slightly open and it's kind of like invitation to go with your gaze in this telephone booth, as you see the picture later. My name is Sage Maricon, and the location I picked was Playland, because whenever you're there, you always have a good time, and it's fun. My favorite part of the whole project, of, I think, was sitting down with all the other kids, sharing a meal together with them at lunch times, and I think that was really great. My favorite part about the project was making new friends. 